Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, for s- episode 99, For Sale, How to Get the Most from Your Unwanted Games. I'm Sean, and live from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone to the lobby here in Twi- on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right, this week is a follow-up to last week's episode where we talked about downsizing your game collection. This week, we're talking about what to do with those games you've decided to get rid of. In addition, we've got two detailed reviews today. Uh, first up, Bastille from Queen Games. And Family Secrets, which is season one, episode one of Escape Mail. And in the Bellhops tabletop this week, we'll feature uh, a little bit more on Bastille, Mackie Stack, Katana, Jaws, Codenames Duet, Medium, and our first play of my Kickstarter copy of Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions. If you'd let, like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, a comment from Definitely a Board Game Podcast at Board Definitely on Twitter about our games <laughs> by Canadian Designers episode. You mentioned my favorite Canadian design team at Senfung Lim, Senfung Lim and Bamboozle Bros, Jay Cormier, but you've shamefully neglected to mention <laughs> their best game, Ak- Akrotiri. Great list, though. I had no idea 1812 would be on there. Kind of appropriate, given the results. <laughs> True enough. Uh, well, thanks for the comment. Definitely a board game podcast, which I am told is definitely a board game podcast. I'm sorry to say I haven't had the pleasure of trying Acro uh, I've definitely seen the game before, but it's not one I played. But what we'll do is what we always do in this case. We will throw a link in the show notes so that others can check the game out. Now, Board Game Gran also wrote in the topic of Canadian games to say, I enjoy Sagrada and was glad it got a mention. I used to play a kidified version, often with my grandson. Hadn't heard of the new Scott Pilgrim game, oddly. Thanks for its inclusion. I'll need to see what your previous questions have been before asking one. Well, thanks for the comment, Board Game Gran. I look forward to your questions once you've caught up with our backlog. Up next, we got a number of comments on last week's topic of curating your game collection by Cullen Games and how you should decide what to get rid of. Brock Wagner, at Brock Wagner on Twitter, writes, I had a flood. That's how I did it. Otherwise, Mm. I rarely call the herd. It's a problem. Ken uh, Burgess wrote to say, the only things I ever passed off was extras to new players. I might be a terrible example of purging. Long Distance Gamers, at Faraway Gamers on Twitter, commented, This is always one of the banes of our gaming Mm -hmm. existence. You've covered some great points in this for our next purge. Excellent. Well, thanks for the comments, Brock, Kenyon, and Long Distance Gamers. Uh, Flooding, that is a lousy reason to have to get rid of games, Uh, especially since most of them are probably just going to get tossed in the trash. You're not going to get anything for those old games. Getting rid of duplicates makes sense, right? If you've got extras, why not? And it's always awesome to see people who are willing to give their games to new gamers to help start their collections. And yeah, no one likes to call their collection really Though I got to admit, when you're done, sometimes you get that like little bit of satisfaction, that whole, I have a a finely curated game collection, come take a look. Well, Robert Aronson on Yumi Social had a more detailed comment. I've been wanting to sell off my relatively small collection of large, expensive games Mm -hmm. because I have no one to play with uh, them Mm -hmm. anymore. And they take up a lot of space. It's just so much trouble to do it. And the one I did manage to put up on eBay twice never Mm -hmm. sold. I'm sure it was priced about right. I only lost even more motivation after that. No one I know even wants the games. LOL. 
Well, Robert, I hope you tune into today's show because uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Some tips and tricks and ideas for actually getting rid of those games, as well as trying to get the most in return for doing so. So hopefully that will uh, will help you out. Well, one final longer comment about on the topic of purging your game collection. Samantha Bryant wrote to say, it's painful every time. We play the game again to make sure we were right about it. We think about whether or not we have better games that do what this one does in a way that pleases us better. Then we try not to grab it back from whoever we give it to. Oh, well, thanks for the comment, Samantha. Uh, there's a follow-up topic we could totally potentially cover in the future, I think, is, is how to get back a game you've gotten rid of that you regret parting with now. Because I think all of us have done it at some point. Yeah. Well, now jumping over to some YouTube comments uh, for things we've got in our video content. First up, Prospero Hall, the Funko design team responsible for the Funkoverse game, Jaws, Disney Villainous, and many other popular board games, took the time to comment on our Funkoverse Harry Potter review. They wrote to say, everyone is a fan of something. Thanks for playing our Funkoverse game. It was created by heavy skirmish gamers, mm. so we hope it does go beyond just introducing new characters into board games. We hope you continue to enjoy it. Now, see, I knew that game had some war game roots because even in our review, I talked about it. I'm like, this is a like really solid intro level miniature skirmish war game that doesn't look like it because it's got these cute pop culture pop figures and Harry Potter license to it and the Golden Girls, right? And I, I, I thought it's pretty cool that I'm like, yeah, there's definitely some war game roots there. It's also cool to see the game seems to have really taken off. There are new sets coming out regularly, like you can get the, the Kool-Aid Man of all things. And from what I hear, Game of Thrones is going to be the next big core set with four new characters. Yep. Yeah. Uh, next, a comment from a designer, this time Daniel Newman on our Dead Man's Cabal review. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the kind words. If you like the sliding mechanic that I used in the ossuary board, check out Ohm mm -hmm. as it was an inspiration for that bit of the game. Well, thanks for the comment, Daniel. I'm going to have to check out Ohm now because that was one of the coolest action selection mechanics I've ever seen. That's one in Dead Man's Cabal where you have the three different types of skulls and they're a row and you push them. And then the one column, whatever color is the most common, is the action you can take, but it can't be the same as last turn. It was a really neat way to do it. <laughs> well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, <laughs> and interacts with our content. All right, one final thing before we move on. Just a correction, I guess, from last week. Uh, last week, I mentioned that fire trucks in Ontario were no longer red. And I guess I don't pay much attention because they are indeed red. I saw one today, actually, when we were out and about. Now, I'm not crazy. There was a period of time where they were bright vermilion, I think is the name of the color, bright yellow green. I don't know how long that lasts. I was trying to find how long a time period that was. I couldn't figure it out. But they are definitely back to red now. A few quick announcements before we continue. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So if you're on social media site, and we're probably there too, but if we're not, let us know and we'll rush right over. I sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your email inbox. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all the content we put out the week previous. That's uh, blog posts, excuse me. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, interviews. We don't do a lot of interviews, but unboxing videos, actual plays, anything we create goes in that list. You can sign up by going to tabletopbellhop.com uh, and click right there in the sideboard or go to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. Though, to be honest, I didn't check it today to see if it's working. It should be. It should be fixed. It was fixed. It was fixed last week. So Yeah, it was fixed last week. I didn't actually go there today. All right, next week, we are going to be celebrating, recording and celebrating on Wednesday, our 100th podcast episode. We're still going to be going live at the same time in the same place, 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. But it would be cool to see a fuller than usual chat room for this special event. Now, as part of the show, we plan on doing a bit of a retrospective, and we are going to answer one of the best gaming and game night topic questions I think we've ever gotten. This one's fantastic. I can't believe no one's asked us this before. Well, because we want you to be able to celebrate with us, we're also planning on launching our next giveaway. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I am going to part with two of my review copies of games. One is one of the hottest games I brought back from Origins 2019, and that's Dead Man's Cabal, which we just heard about a bit in the... Um, announcement section with a really cool mechanic based on all my guess and the second is going to be the alpha this has just been released last month 
from bicycle cards. So I got something from last year and some new hotness from this year. Now, similar to our previous contest, this will run for three weeks. We'll be raw, drawing two winners. The first will get a choice of these two games, and the second will win the one that wasn't picked. Perfect. Now, unfortunately, due to shipping costs, uh, we're going to have to keep this open only to Canada and the U.S., so I do apologize. I know we've got some uh, Australian listeners out there, and we were really hot in Hawaii one day. I don't, I don't know where that came from. We had a bunch of downloads there. So I do apologize. So, so Canada and the, the continental U.S., please. As a bonus for those of you joining us for our 100th episode, we'll be dropping a special code in the chat that will get you... A large number of bonus entries. We haven't decided yet. It's going to be like 20, but I'm thinking of making it like here. You guys who join us live, you folk who join us live, get like 100 bonus entries just for joining us during that episode. We're strongly considering that 100. If it's not 100, I'm going to think 20 or so. All right. Also, uh, we got another big uh, arbitrary number coming up. And that is our two-year anniversary. Uh, that is going to happen. I forget the exact days, like the 26th or the 27th. It's in there. and But we're going to celebrate on the 29th of July. Now, the 29th of July is also the last Wednesday of the month. So it's going to be an AMA episode. So that, to me, that works out pretty good because we can be more relaxed about our content. So I think we'll be able to celebrate that then. We'll get out more words about the, um, the giveaway at that time, too. So if there's anything you want to ask us about uh, doing this uh, now two years in, that is the episode to do it. Yeah, if you want to know anything about what we did, what we started up, what we've done right, what we've done wrong, if you got any questions, that'll be the episode. That, that's the one I, I want to hear, like, podcast questions. Yeah, yeah, like, whether, you know, the, the tech setup, processes, whatever. We're, we're like we're what's changed, what we've done, what we've learned. Those are the kind of questions I'm looking for. I'll, we'll still answer anything, but I'd like to get away from the usual game game night stuff and maybe even answer some questions about Sean and I, something about the show, anything you've always wanted to ask. That'll be the episode to do it. Well, we're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We are everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to come to us is through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today, we've got a question from longtime fan of the show, Yuho Rutila. Hi, Mo and Sean. I think this situation comes up every in every gamer's life. The board game shelf is full and significant others starts to hint that you can make space on the shelf by selling some of the hard collected games. How do you go choosing the games to let go is it the time since the last on the table or the overall time on the table? Should I still spare the gem that gets played too seldom? Or how about games with personal bond or a signed game from a designer? Where do you sell your used or even shrink wrapped game? Friendly local game store, eBay, Facebook, other places. How do you decide the right price for the game? What if it's a collector's item? How do you find these things out? Any hints on the topic are welcome, as I am facing this very problem at the moment. Cheers, Yuho. All right, Yuho, we're going to try to hook you up here. So today is actually a follow-up to last week's topic, where we answered the first part of Yuho's question, which was in regards to choosing what to let go of. Now, if you haven't checked that out, you may want to go give that a listen before continuing this episode, since this is a follow-up. Don't worry, we'll wait. All right, time's up. You missed your chance to get, we're moving on. All right, now that you've taken the time to figure out which of your games you want to get rid of and you got a nice stack of games to clear from your collection, leaving you with a shinier, tighter, more streamlined game collection, it's time to talk about how to get rid of those games. Now, what I think I want to focus on the most here tonight, because I think this will be the most value for people, is on where to sell or trade your games with the goal of getting the most in return for them. This will include a look at how to value your games and set an appropriate price. To help us out with that, we've got a special guest on the show tonight, and she games. Deanna Tuzinho will be joining us. She has a lot of experience valuing games, both from our Extra Life auctions held every year, as well as running a small business selling retro toys and games. Welcome, Deanna. Hey, guys. So before we get into valuing game, I first want to talk a bit about where to look to sell your games. What are the best places you've found over the years to try to get rid of geeky items? 
like games. Okay, well, the first thing that comes to mind usually is eBay. Um, and there's a link there that you can drop in the chat if you want. So the thing with eBay is you don't want to just go in cold and start selling stuff because no one's going to buy off you. You want to build up an account. You want to have some feedback and you want to um, purchase some items first just so you experience the environment, you know what the heck's going on. So that's a good way to start. Uh, another place that you can sell online is Amazon. Amazon mm -hmm. allows you to sell new or used on, in toys and games. So uh, I think they listed as collectibles for used items. Um, now, I haven't sold on Amazon in about seven years. And when I did, it was on .ca. But I was looking into it, and they added a new thing where there's a limit to being able to sell during the holiday season. If you don't already have enough feedback built up, you won't be able to sell during certain times of okay. the year. And also, again, you want to have a, a, an account on there, maybe just put out some cheaper items, some less valuable items to build up feedback. You're not going to get feedback from buying on Amazon, only from, from selling, whereas eBay, you're going to get it both ways, right? So um, that's two places. And then there's also, for online, there's the Board Game Geek Marketplace, which Mo knows a lot more about than I do. All right. So the best thing about using Board Game Geek is that you are selling games to gamers, right? Board Game Geek is filled with uh, alpha gamers, right? People who take the time to make a Board Game Geek account, take the hobby very seriously, right? And the people on Board Game Geek know what games are worth. And because of that, they are willing to pay premiums for things like out of print or rare games or collector's items or signed copies. Now, the bad thing about Board Game Geek is that they're gamers and they care a lot about their games. And because of that, they're very picky in regards to the conditions of the games they're buying. The thing is on their marketplace, you do get to specify the condition in your listings. The thing is on Board Game Geek, like seriously, be as clear as possible. Every little scratch, every fold. If you have a shrink craft game and there's a tear in the shrink, make sure people know that. Now, as long as you commit and give all that information, you're not gonna have a problem, but just realize that many of the board game people searching the board game marketplace are collectors as well as gamers and are looking for collector level items. And that's actually a really important thing, both uh, on BGG Marketplace and as you said on eBay and Amazon, is uh, having some uh, sort of standing, right? If, if you're a newbie on BGG, no, no one's going to take you seriously. And the same with eBay and the same with Amazon. Uh, unfortunately, if you're just trying to get rid of the, your first game for the first time, no matter where you go, you are going to have more difficulties yeah. on those kind of sites. Yeah, you can't just go in and be like, hey guys, I got this copy of Fireball Island. Want to buy it for 160 bucks and it's the first thing you've ever listed. No one's going to pay attention to you. Yeah, it's definitely unlikely, which may have been the problem with the, um, we had a question earlier who noted what do you do if um, the, the person who had noted they tried to sell a game multiple times, mm -hmm. if that was the first thing they ever tried to list it, that could have been the problem. You might want to start with some lower like $10 value items just to build up feedback. And then what Mo said about condition, it's important on eBay too. I find yeah. gamers in general, people that are buying games are going to be super picky. It's a, a character trait apparently. Yes. So you know, make sure you describe it very clearly exactly what's there and exactly what state it's in or else when people get it, they're going to be unhappy and then you're going to get negative feedback. So, um, but with all of the above, when you're selling online, you have to consider shipping, which can be a pain in the butt. Uh, so you're going to have to parcel it up take it to the post office, get it weighed, find out how much shipping is going to be so that you can put that in your eBay listing accurately. Uh, Amazon, I think, estimates a shipping amount on its own. Um, but then on top of that, you have to worry about insurance and potentially missing parcels. You, know, you might have bad actors that claim that they haven't gotten stuff when they have, or things can just go AWOL. So, I mean, that's all stuff you have to worry about when you're selling online. So then sometimes it, you're better off just selling locally, right? So you've got Kijiji for local. You've got um, Facebook groups now are really great. Locally, we have um, a couple of good uh, uh, groups where you can do buy and sell for games. And in all of those, I find that if you list multiple items for the, it's true online too with, with um, eBay, but even more so for in-person uh, trades, if you list multiple items, it's better. If you if you put four or five games up all at once in that 
buy and sell group, then someone is going to contact you and say, hey, I want to get all three of those. It's worth your time more to go out to McDonald's and meet that person if you're doing it all in one go. It's just better if you're going to do it, do it all at once. And then the last one is uh, your FLGS. If you're lucky enough for them to offer consignment or maybe they'll buy directly off you for resale, um, that's another good option for local. All right, you need to speak up a bit more, or point at the mic. Ryan says it sounds like you're walking around the room. Yeah, no, sorry, but I've I've been trying to trying to ride it, uh, ride it, and, and just sort of keep it. So I did I did up the gain on the mic a little bit. I'm wondering if I should switch to the all round instead of the focused. I might might not hurt. Okay, um, that's what I'm thinking yeah. for the second half. So unfortunately, a lot of FLGSs don't handle consignment, and so that may be a limiting factor. It can be a great option if it's there, but it may not be an option at all, and uh, you want to make sure you, you're aware of uh, how they handle things because if they're just doing it for the heck of it, they may not be willing to get you a decent deal or, or give any effort to uh, put, in, put into selling your game, and it might just sit there forever, not making you any money, even though it's off your shelf. The other thing too is some local game stores, especially when you get into uh, non-board game items, might be willing to buy things like magic cards, right? Collectible cards, uh, Pokemon cards, hero clicks, any of the collectible stuff, um, key forge decks, local game stores are often willing to buy that stuff. And the other thing is check your local comic book store, especially with the, the hero items, like hero clicks often sell there. And some of the kids' cards games, like they may not do magic, but they might do um, Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh! And Ryan's right, noticing so that uh, Board Game Bliss offers local consignment uh, there you and go. things as well. So. so just a quick audio check. Is this any better? Hey, guys. Can you hear me now? It's, yeah. Should be a little bit better. All right. We're going to have outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now that you know where you want to try to sell your game or games, what's the best way to try to find a fair price? What? Where do you list them at? How do you, how do you have any idea how much to ask for these games because i'll say one thing you don't see is it almost never works where you just go make me an offer it seems like as a seller you pretty much have to put that out first well again the first thing you want to consider is what condition is it in your used game is not going to be worth uh, a new and sealed copy that's still in print right is it is it available is it still in print can you go out and easily buy a new copy um now you can figure out the MSRP on a game by looking at a site like boardgameprices.com, which aggregates pricing from several online stores. And you can click through and look at a couple different online stores and then you can go, oh, okay. So I know the MSRP on that's $50. And about half of MSRP is a good rule of thumb for a used game, unless it's out of print or rare. Even if it's new and sealed, no one's going to want to pay full retail, again, unless it's out of print, right? So you got to plan to knock at least 5 or $10 off the price from the MSRP, even for a brand new game. Now, when you're trying to figure out prices for stuff that might be out of print, the first thing to keep in mind is Amazon is not a good source for that information <laughs> because third-party sellers can just put whatever crack a doodle idea they have they can say oh i've decided that this game is 300 dollars and it doesn't mean that it's selling for that much it just means that someone decided to list it for that much yeah. and the same can hold true at ebay as well which is why i'll get to that in a second but amazon is particularly bad for just having wacky prices so just ignore that for trying to sell for trying to set uh what dollar value you want to use and then you can look at ebay Again, this is your prime area to look for uh, out of print items or new and old, rare, whatever. What you do is you go in and you look at sold items on eBay. Um, you go into the left hand sidebar, you scroll down until it says show only and you check off completed items. And that will give you the data on what was sold and unsold. Don't check off sold items. that will only show you what was completed and sold. You want to see both so you get a good idea. And that info will go back for 60 days worth. Now, there are sites out there that will let you see the historic data for more than 60 days. And if you have something that's rare that when you're looking it up, you're not finding enough examples to get a good idea, it might be worth it. Um, but most of those you have to pay for to use those sites. 
uh, a third party example is WorthPoint. And I think there's a free seven day trial you can use. So that might be enough to get you by. Or eBay has an in-house program now called TerraPeak, which is available for free if you have a store with them for certain levels of sellers. Um, so basically you scroll through, you look at the completed items, you get an idea of the average selling price. And again, you have to make sure it's in similar condition to yours. Your well-worn copy of the Dark Tower, which is missing all but one flag, is not <laughs> going to be worth the same amount as a pristine copy with all the pieces, right? All right. So looking at the Board Game Geek Marketplace, this is another place that, besides being a place to sell of games, is a great place to see the current going marketplace, the current market price. Because as I mentioned earlier, the people on Board Game Geek know what games are worth and are usually willing to pay for those games. So this makes it a great place to shop for the prices that gamers are willing to pay. Now, the marketplace when you go to, it's really simple. You just look up the game and you can see the, the, the basic marketplace that shows like the top five items. You can click on it and get the detail and you'll see all the available copies of the game for sale by country, including then if you click through, you can start seeing the, uh, the condition in the current selling price. The one uh, problem with this is that there's no history, right? So you can only see what's currently listed up for sale right now and what people are asking for now with no actual indication what's been sold. So you might bring up um, whatever, Fireball Island, and there's seven copies for $400 because everyone just set their price over the person above them. And it ends up no one's actually bought a copy for 700 So you don't get that information. But generally, the board game geek users don't do that. And if you do see it, you'll bring it up. and You'll see that one price that's usually crazy high, and the rest are all pretty much around the same area. Now, this is where there's a site called Spielboy. If you go to Spielboy, this is a board game pricing utility that's ugly as sin, I will admit, that shows you historical pricing data on games listed in the Board Game Geek micro, or Marketplace. So that is your best bet, is you find the game on Board Game Geek, you look in the marketplace and bring it up on Spielboy and you get all the history to see every copy of that game that's sold on the Board Game Geek Marketplace since the beginning of time. And that is probably your best bet for finding a price. Because again, most of the people on Board Game Geek know the values of the games. Or if they, they're the, honestly, the people who are probably setting the values of the games. They're the ones setting the current market price. Now, one thing you do need to be aware of, uh, if, you're, if you are pricing things on Board Game Geek, these are gamers. These are yeah. not real people. <laughs> um, so if you're going to be selling to your local Kijiji market, there may only be a couple of gamers in the area who yeah. are willing to pay gamer prices. Uh, your average Joe on the street is probably not going to be willing to pay collector's prices, even if that's what the game may be worth to collectors. Yeah. So you have to be aware that your marketplace where you're selling may, you know, determine some of that pricing. Even if you mm -hmm. know that, that, you know, sealed box, uh, wow, is should be worth $300. Joe down the street isn't going to pay that. Yeah, we've definitely seen that uh, with something we'll be getting to later, which is one of the alternatives for selling games, which is to auction them, where we will have a $300 game go for like 20 bucks because just no one cares that it's a collectible game. They're just like, hey, I spent 20 bucks, I got a cool game. If no one wants it locally, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's not even locally, right? Like that's part of the problem with all of this is it is a free market and fair market value is going to be based on supply and demand. If there's a ton of people selling the same game as you right now. You're probably not going to get good money for it. Whereas if there's very few copies, there's a better chance you can charge a bit more. But I strongly feel that it can be worth um, making less money and selling it locally because there's that pain in the butt factor. Yeah. Because you can get the best dollar by, by selling it on eBay maybe, but it's going to take up the most time going back and forth and email answering questions. You have to pack it up. You have to take it to the post office. You got to worry about those missing parcels. And so when you're building your price locally, you can tell yourself, okay, I'm going to go a little bit lower than that. Also, eBay is going to take off a, a chunk of commission. Yeah. Uh, PayPal is going to take off a chunk of commission. You sell it to a guy on Kijiji and they go give you 50 bucks at uh, McDonald's. Nobody's taking a percent off that. Mm -hmm. So you, you got to factor that in too, right? So um, back to when you're coming up with your prices, uh, some items have straight up uh, price guides 
when you're thinking of magic cards, mm -hmm. collectible cards. Uh, the site that at least the local stores use is tcgplayer.com. So that covers like your Pokemon, magic, pretty much any CCG you can think of. They use the median prices on there when determining what they might pay you if you're going to go in and sell cards. Yeah, from what I understand, that's pretty much the standard, at least in Canada. I don't know if this is true in the States, but at least for Canada, that is the site that everyone uses. And they do that so that they don't have to compete with each other. Like, honestly, if the, the we have two local game stores that are, are, I don't know, about 10 steps away from each other, which is a little ridiculous. And they both use the same pricing guide. So you go to the store you prefer. You're not going to get a better deal at one than the other in general. So again, that that factor that it might be more convenient for you to sell locally means you you might pick a price that you're willing to settle for a little bit less. But then when you go to list that on Kijiji or Facebook, you're probably going to want to put a little padding there because people are going to want to barter you down. You're going to say, I want $50 for this item, and they're going to say $40 every time. Yeah, Facebook it, is terrible. Right. No one's just going to say, okay, cool, $50. Bucks. Like, that almost never happens. So if you know you really want $40 for the game, ask for $45 or $50. Be prepared to haggle. Again, you're likely listing a bunch of items at once, and someone will say, hey, if I buy 40 mm -hmm. off, if I buy these four items off you, will you give all of them to me for $100? And you can say no, too. Like, don't be afraid to say no point. and to barter back and to say, yeah, the lowest I'm willing to go is X and have that lowest price already in your mind. Um, and then back online on eBay, it's a little bit different. If you're setting the opening bid on eBay, you might want to take a chance and go a little bit lower than the minimum you want because you're hoping to bid, build interest and that folks will bid it up. So, I mean, you can play it safe and you can start your opening bid right where your minimum price is, or you can cut yourself a bit below that and then you might find that you actually make a bunch more money. It's your call. Yeah, the biggest thing on eBay that you want to do is you want to spark a bidding war. You want two people to want that item, and then they start going against each other, and then they stop looking at other items and comparing prices anymore and only care about beating that other person. That, that's what you're hoping to have happen, which can happen by starting. If it's low enough. If yeah. your price is just right, people will probably just snipe it. Yeah. Right. They'll just come in and bid at the very last second and the, they'll be willing to spend 20 bucks on it, whatever. But if you know it's worth 20 or $30 and then instead you set it for 12, well, you might get that, that added interest, but you're taking a chance. It doesn't yeah. always pay off. Yeah. And one of the things you need to, to pay attention of, and, and you touched on this earlier about, you know, condition of things, especially, but when it comes to Kijiji or eBay, there will be people who will pester you to no end about every detail and aspect of that product. They mm -hmm. want to know if, hey, can you, you, you didn't take a picture of this particular angle and I saw a, a, a version of that product once that had a little bit of flashing on it and does yours have that or not? And be aware that there is a uh, element of time that you need to sort of put aside to deal with people like this, um, unless you're willing to just sort of shut them down and, and completely ignore that avenue of sale. But there are a lot of people out there, both on EG, yeah, eBay and, and Arcade, who will want to come, or, you know, if it's local, uh, can we come by and look at that? I want to double mm -hmm. check and see if that's really this and that. And, you know, there's a whole lot of hassle involved. Um, you, it's it's much like running a, a yard sale, right? There's all these people who mm -hmm. want to waste your time without necessarily even ever planning to buy the item. And that's probably one that, that this is intentionally not on our list. You do not want to sell your stuff at a yard sale unless you're just like getting rid of it. Like you don't care. Like it, it, instead of throwing it out, maybe. If it was but, in the flood, then yeah, you can put it in the yard sale. You can put sale. it in the yard sale. Like, like we've tried it, right? Like I tried to sell collectibles at a yard sale and we can kind of get away with it if you have like the one table of collectibles. But even then people are going to walk up to your $50 item and go, I'll give you a nickel. Like it's that bad. Yeah. And you got to keep an eye on it because if it's new and sealed, they'll try and open it. I've yes. had that happen at yard sales. I, yeah. I just go yeah. passed out and like, get your hands <laughs> off that. And people like to walk away with the collectible items well, because you highlighted them as collectible, which is yeah. unfortunate. So yeah, we do not recommend selling anything you actually want to get something value for, not at yard sales. If you got some junk to get rid of, sure. 
All right. So, so far tonight, we talked about selling your unwanted games, but there are other options. Uh, one I particularly like and often do myself is trading my games for other games. Now, this is a great way to both grow and curate your collection while trying to keep the overall size down. Now, here are some places you can do this at that I found uh, work really well. And the first, again, we're going to go back to Board Game Geek. Again, you go where the geeks are, right? You go where your market is. It's a location, location, location thing. Uh, we've already talked about this as a great place to figure out the value of your games, but it's all as a, also an option for selling. But one of the other features is you can go into your board game collection or into any game, whether it's marked as you own it or not, but you can go through their entire collection, the entire database, and just click for trade on anything you own that you're willing to trade with. And similarly, you can go in and go want in trade and click on a bunch of different games. And then from that, you can go to a game and click who wants games and trade. So if you have a game to get rid of, go on Board Game Geek, find that game, click on Want and Trade, and there is a list of people who want to trade you something for that game. Now, meshing those two up is a bit of an artwork, but it is a way to find people who are looking for your game. And sometimes those people might even be willing to buy it, right? So this might also be a way to find seller, or someone who's just going to buy it outright. Now, another interesting feature, now this is something we hadn't really talked on earlier, in the episode is instead of selling a whole game, but selling a game for bits, right? Selling parts. And this is a great way to get rid of components you have from incomplete games. Like if you've got a copy of Hero Quest, it's worth a fortune. But if you just happen to have the doors from Hero Quest, those can be worth some money. So if you go on Board Game Geek, there are two more things you can click off. And one is has parts and the other is wants parts. So this is a great way to get rid of those leftover bits. So if you did have the flood, instead of throwing out the whole game, separate what's damaged from what's not. And then you can go on board game. You can look and see if anyone wants the parts from those games. Yeah, that's totally viable. I've made tons of money on eBay, breaking games down and selling them by bits. I, I would wait until I tried to get like the full game. But if that didn't pan out, you can sometimes make more money by selling them piecemeal. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily recommend doing that. But yes, you could go buy a complete game and take it apart and sell the bits and make money in some cases. It has to be out of print or something. Yeah. 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 Uh, locally, Facebook has been fantastic for trading games with local gamers. Uh, there are two very active local groups just for Windsor, Windsor Essex, really. So it goes out to the county. And I got to say, Windsor's not that big, right? So uh, just, just with the, the, the law of averages or whatever, law of large numbers, I don't remember which law it is. But the fact that we have two here means probably most places have a Facebook group. And not only that, there's a Canada-wide board game, buy, sell, and trade group that I see people in all the time. And then I know there's a board game group that actually does trading the world over. I don't get that involved in that one because again, shipping is a pain in the butt. But what I would do is stage. I would start locally and I would post my games there for a week or a month. And then I would move up and go, okay, how about anywhere in Canada? Someone want this? Okay, anywhere in the world want this game. And again, you got buy, sell and trade. Now, once you get a trade, it's just a matter of talking to someone in Facebook chat, right? You just bring up Messenger. It's like, yeah, hey, I've got this. What do you have? What do you want? Now, cons are another great way to trade games and, and get new games and get rid of your games. And this can also be even just smaller gatherings, not necessarily cons. So pretty much every con, uh, I'll admit, I'm not a huge con goer. We only really recently started our con journey about five years ago. But every con I have been to has some form of trade system or barter system, a trading room, uh, a rare game auction or something, something you can put your games into to get rid of them. Now, locally, game stores often set up trade nights. And I noticed even uh, Pennywise in our chat was talking about how their local store has done this, where they have a trade night where people can get together. We try to do these, we we're trying to do them once a quarter before the whole pandemic thing hit. And we mix it up between board games and RPGs where we let people just trade their stuff, right? Uh, I think this is really cool. So one of the things you can do is check your local gaming meetups and see if they offer anything like this. Or if you have a local group that gets together, like a tabs or a... Uh, or, or something like that, like a, a meetup group that gets together regularly, ask, like, hey, why don't we have a trade night sometime where we can swap our games, have, have some kind of swap group. Yeah, and Mo came up with a pretty cool system where instead of people putting all their stuff out on the table and just trading items, we traded everything in for uh, coins, basically, right? Like yeah, tokens. Uh, po poker chips, tokens. So, you know, a uh, core book is worth X, a module is worth X, because we did it with our RPGs mostly, yep. and you would get your pile of tokens, and then we would roll to see who had initiative, and you would take turns picking what you wanted off the table with your tokens, and that was a neat way to be able to trade up and not have to 
you know, Sally didn't have to get it off of Dave kind of thing. Yeah, which... it, was, it helped a couple issues. So one of them, you didn't know who you were trading off of because that may matter to some people. And second, you didn't worry about the exact value of your game. You weren't worried about that. My player's handbook's worth fifty dollars, and yours is only worth twenty. So I also need a thirty dollar item. It was, you know what? It's a board game. Board games are worth five tokens. Small box games are worth two tokens, and card games like Uno or whatever are worth one token. And you spend five tokens, you can get five card games, or you spend five tokens, you get a board game. A board game's a board game. Say like a ticket to ride size box. Maybe you have the all or ten token Eclipse phase or uh, Eclipse or. Twilight Imperium level or whatever. And like to RPGs, it was it was um splat book, module, core book was basically how we split it up. And so we didn't have to worry about the fact that the Pathfinder book's 900 pages long and the well, we'll actually use Eclipse phase this time is only 300 pages and their MSRPs are actually quite far apart. It was here's one hardcover rule book for another hardcover rule book. It worked out well. Yeah. Now speaking of cons and get togethers and trading. One of the things that is the best, and I guess a, 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 probably the most efficient way to get rid of games, replacing them with games you want, is a math trade. Now, this is, uh, the basics here is that a group of people decide they all want to trade games. And they use a specific piece of software to create a list of all the games they're willing to trade away. And you just go in and you select them all. And it's tied to Board Game Geek. So you go in and you pick all the games you want to get rid of. You're like, here, here's all the stuff I'm willing to get rid of. And then once everyone's done that, there's like a certain time period for everyone to put in their games. Then everyone gets the list. And now it's a list of everything that everyone's put in the pile, we'll say. And you start going through and you're like, oh, I want that. And I want that. And I want that. And I want that. And then there's an extra step where you go, well, you wanted this. What are you willing to trade for that? So you go back to your initial list and you do this little pairing off thing where it's like, well, yeah, I wanted a copy of that and I'm willing to give up this, 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 or this for that. And then you sit back and relax while everyone else does that. And then the moderator, whoever's running it, runs the software. Now, I honestly have no idea what goes into this back end. It's, it's math doing stuff in the background. But the end result is that you end up trading your stuff. So once the software does all its stuff, it's going to set up a ton of trades. And the interesting part is it'll be with a bunch of different people so that everyone gets stuff they want. So like, for example, I might trade something to Deanna, but end up getting something from Dave. Whereas Deanna is actually getting two things from Sean and Dave's getting something from Tom, but like it all works. Like the, the software did the thing. I just, I give up the games I want and I get the games I wanted in return. It's the more complex version of the token system. In, in a way, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the, where, the, where the tokens were a little more arbitrary in the math trade system, there, there's real values applied yeah, to Yeah, there's real value. Because you can literally say, like, I only want this game if I give up this for it. Mm -hmm. But the weird part is I might not get this game for that directly, right? That's where the math trade comes right. in. Like, Sean may have actually gotten this, and, and Sean might have given up three games to get that, but I end up getting something. Like, it's 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 funky. It's it's I've finally done one. I've now taken part. We only had about 12 people, so there wasn't a lot. But, like, you know what? I got rid of three games, and I got two games I really wanted. And, and like I said, it's you get what you want. Like, you 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 have complete control over what you let go and what you get in return. Without any bartering, there's no interaction with these people, which is, I got to say, at times an added bonus. Oh, absolutely, and, and sometimes that can be that can be the, the the real thing because you're avoiding, as long as you're upfront and 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 clear about everything, yes. you're avoiding a lot of that haggling hassle mm -hmm. that you you run into on your Kijijis and your Ebay's and your Facebook. People aren't haggling over prices; they aren't questioning about every little detail. It's mm -hmm. just they're looking for what they want. You're looking for what you want. And the software does the rest. You don't yeah. have to. It doesn't matter whether Jane and Bob are idiots or yeah. you know whatever. It doesn't matter. They're going to get what they want. You're going to get what you want within the limits of the software. Now, the one thing I don't know about math trades is what you do when something goes wrong. Like I honestly have no idea. So I, I like it. I say I got a game and it was missing a piece. Like I don't even know whose game it was. So I don't know how that level of it works. You you would have to talk to like Q ran it. I'd have mm -hmm. to be like Q, this copy of this I got has no. So there's definitely an upfront level of trust required for people to have described the games to uh, in detail, right? So it goes back to being honest about what you have. Like that's the other thing, right? Like like be human, be nice. Don't try to rip people off. 
like even when you're setting your prices don't try to scam people don't this is this is like kind of off topic but on topic don't say something's out of print that's not like check make sure it's actually out of print don't claim something's uh you know whatever signed or it's a first printing when it's not like don't scam people <laughs> just just be honest about the actual condition don't try to tape something together because they won't notice don't glue if you glue something back together you indicate that too because glue bonds are usually not as strong as the original bond even though it might look like it's in perfect shape just be honest Yep. replacing components with second edition bits yes not cool yeah if, if you've got replacement components that's not cool yeah no and then once once you've decided to to make something happen there's you're still not done right so yeah. if it's one thing if you're able to walk down to the uh, post office and throw it in there uh and then you have to deal with tracking and making sure that something gets there and dealing with insurance and if something gets lost what happens so there's all that but even if you're doing something local, you still have to take precautions and you need mm. to be aware. Uh, if you're selling something on Kijiji, for instance, you don't want a bunch of strangers knowing where you live, especially if you're selling collector's items. Yes. Uh, this is not safe. And while going to you know McDonald's may be a reasonable option because it's reasonably busy, no one at McDonald's cares if <laughs> someone is knifing you in the parking lot. Um, whereas, uh, what's luckily been happening in more and more cities is the actual police offices, mm -hmm. uh, police stations have been opening up trading areas and saying, Hey, look, do you have something you need to trade on Kijiji? Do you need to, you, you don't want to bring strangers to your house, come down to the police station. We have this, you know, front lobby that's monitored by cameras with armed guards, uh, stop on by and do your trade there. Cause honestly, if the person you're trading with doesn't want to stop by the police station, maybe you don't want to be trading with them in the first place. Fair enough. <laughs> but but stick to stick to crowded locations like a McDonald's. Yeah. But but like a McDonald's at three o'clock in the afternoon, not a McDonald's yeah. at two o'clock in the morning. McDonald's um, not husky. <laughs> <laughs> you wanna you wanna make sure that you are in a crowded place where you can feel safe if it does turn into mm -hmm. a situation where the other person is becoming aggressive for any reason. Yeah. No, very true. Be, be in a public place or go uh, even going, don't trust, go to their house. Yeah. Especially if they live in an apartment building where you have to buzz in so that you're, you're being removed from the public. Yeah. Going to your, your the, the, going, going to someone else's house is no better than, yeah, than that's them coming I'm to your house. <laughs> it's potentially worse. Like, yeah. In my opinion, if you're the one selling the game, you're probably straight up trying to sell the game. But yeah. like dropping something off at someone's house, you worry about leaving the game there and not getting anything in return. Yeah. My favorite is if you can do it at the FLGS, but I always feel weird about it, selling games at the FLGS, right? You're like, yeah, that's uh, don't buy their stuff, buy my used thing instead. But it is, I mean, from a safety point of view, it's great. Yeah. Local game store is a great place to do it, but check with your store. So that's an important side note off that yeah. is, is don't just assume that it's cool that you're going to sell your magic collection at the local game store when they're selling magic cards themselves. They may not be cool with that, or they might be perfectly cool with it. Yeah. I, it depends. Depends on the store, but always ask with them. Um, the one of our local game stores does not encourage it all the time, but they set aside special events specifically for doing it. The best thing though, is if your local store doesn't offer consignment, ask why? Um, because, our local game store, the owner of it, did some research into it with a at a game convention at Gamma, um, talking to other stores and how much money they're making off consignments. And basically, he left with the impression of you're kind of dumb if you don't. Like it's just it's an untapped market, and game stores are having a hard time nowadays. Like I'm not even talking. We're pretending there's no pandemic tonight. <laughs> We'd have a whole different list of topics for meeting for with people and porch drops and right yeah. and. and <laughs> We're going to ignore all that for tonight, thankfully. We'll just forget that's going on. But having consignments, just take, like, all the stores do is take a percentage, right? They give up a bit of their space. They take a percentage off the top. Uh, I don't know what that would be. Like, I'm not a store owner. I don't know what it would be. But, like, look at the prices eBay is charging and make it less than that, but not too crazy, right? And then they put aside in the spot in the store and they sell consignment games. Because they're still going to sell their shiny new copies. Because people are collectors and like shiny new copies. They're it just because there's a forty dollar copy of Root that's used there doesn't mean the seventy dollar new copy is not going to sell necessarily. You're actually selling to two different markets at that point. 
the person that's going to buy the $40 copy was never going to buy the $75 copy. And the person that's going to buy the $75 doesn't want that used copy someone else has touched. Like it's literally, it's, it's two different vectors. Mm -hmm. And that's the way to think of it as a store owner. So they like said, if they don't, I would recommend it. The one here was supposed to launch it. That was actually yeah. what I plan to do with my, my growing pile of reviews, Time. review copies of games that I've, I've played and I don't necessarily feel like keeping despite the fact that being pretty good games. Yeah, no, I, and and I just make sure you're informed uh, in the chat room. There, they are talking about you know again. If you're doing a math trade, make sure you read the fine print. You yeah. want to know what you're getting into. If you are going with consignment somewhere, make sure up front you know who's setting the price, what mm -hmm. the percentages are, when payment is going to be due. Are they going to be paying you up front and they're going to handle the rest of it, or are you not going to see a dime until they sell it? Uh, you know that. Yeah. they're holding on to that material and you need to make sure that you know when it's getting sold um, yeah. and, and when, how much, how long after it gets sold, will you be paid? I'm going to hop back for one. I mentioned about like using eBay as a source to set your price, but if you go on eBay and you decide, Hey, it regularly sells on eBay for like $120 us. And I'm going to sell it locally for $90 Canadian. Use that as a selling point. Tell people yeah, tell that people. your listing when you put it up. Yeah, if you if you've done the research, let people know. Like, hey, the, I, I we do this constantly for our extra life auctions. We're like, all right, currently going on eBay for this much, right? Currently selling on Amazon for this much. Yep, no, absolutely. All right, so we talked about selling games, we talked about trading games, but there are alternatives to both of these options. When you don't necessarily want or need to get anything in return, and that's donating your games to a good cause. Yeah, you can donate your unwanted games to a local school, like grade schools would love to have games, even high schools or a library, um, or you could give them to your local FLGS or game cafe for their uh, in-store library. And that has the added bonus of if it's just a space issue, maybe you know you can still go there and play it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can also just give your games direct to local gamers, right? If you're we talked about how you're doing your one and done, right? So one of the topics we talked about last week was before you get rid of a game that's been sitting on your shelf forever and you haven't played it in forever, give it one more play. If you play that one more play and there's four of you playing and you're like, eh, yeah, I don't need to keep this. But one of the other players is like, damn, I really like this game. Just give it to them. Here you go. Have this game. We're done with it. We've had enough. You seem to have fun with it. Or people who are just starting off in the hobby or just getting into their collections. I do a lot of public play events where I get new gamers out and like, I wish I had a couple extra copies of Gokuko around. Like it's a cheap enough game that like some people get so hyped that I'd, I'd love to be able to be like, here, just take a copy, go home. Right. Like, the, the, or even in all these Facebook groups and stuff like that. Right. Like just the whole um, play it forward kind of thing, like put it up for sale and you don't get anyone for a while. And then someone gets a hold of you finally. And they're like, Oh, I'm really excited. About this. So you're like, you know what? I've had that up for a month. You can just have it. Right. It's going to go to, especially if someone's excited, right? Because to me, that's a good thing to do because the person's going, it's going to a gamer. They're going to play the game. Yep. Now, another option is to donate them to a charity. Um, there's the Salvation Army. There's May Court. There's um, Goodwill and all that. Uh, for one thing, you're going to end up making someone really happy when they take a picture of it and share it on Facebook to their Goodwill find. Um, other than that, like that's generally not what I would do, but it is an option. To me, that's better than throwing it out. Probably better than throwing it in a yard sale and getting a buck. Yeah. Like you might as well drop it off at some, you know your Value Village or whatever your local uh, charity or resale shop is. Or you can upcycle it and turn it into something else because uh, that was one of the suggestions last week when we were talking yep. about purging games. Someone in the chat room has suggested turning it into wall art, which is a very cool idea. Yep. Or we have locally extra life auctions. You might have something similar local to you and that's a really cool way to get rid of your games and know that it's going to a good cause and, and still staying local probably and going to be out maybe at public play events and in the community. So, you know, it's cool. We have a lot of generous local gamers that will yeah. donate items every year for our extra life. And we raise thousands of dollars that way. So it's pretty cool. And yeah, uh, so another, anyone who do sorry, another great comment in the uh, chat room is donate to a uh, local gamer design club. If there is one, uh, so that they can use those parts in turn yeah. them into the next great board game. No, it makes perfect cool sense. Idea. Yeah. And for those who don't know what extra life is, it's a 24 hour gaming charity that raises money for the children's miracle network hospitals. Uh, the goal is to game for 24 hours. It's uh, always around November every year. 
gamers the world over take participate it's something we participated in for uh, 10 years now i think i don't even know it might be 11 and we've raised like over fifteen thousand dollars us doing that and a big part of that are extra life auctions which does lead me to auctions in general this is something you can do i've seen people do them online i've seen people do them in facebook i've seen people do them at local events you can also auction off your game now what's cool about auctions is you get that bidding war right you get that chance that you're like hey you know what i got a copy of roots 20 bucks anyone want it and then like, yeah, i'll buy it for 20 oh i want 25 i want 30 and it keeps going up and it ends up you can make some really good money off it now again if you're going to do this at local game store make sure you ask this was something else that our local game store was hoping to do more often during the year than they do now and plus we ran one for Geekropolis we did um unfortunately because a gamer had passed away and we were getting rid of his game collection that managed to raise enough money to basically open a game store and auctions can be a great way to get great money for your stuff or sell it all dirt cheap so you really got to watch it with auctions it depends on your crowd if your crowd's got some big spenders in it you'll do awesome but a lot of people go to auctions to look for deals so to me, they're very hit and miss, and they are very stressful and a lot of work. Like, I think more so than having to deal with the idiot on eBay that you've been talking to a million times, and he's shipping the package, and he says he didn't get it. And, like, that's simple compared to managing an auction. Yeah, and then you use all this information to set your prices, your opening prices for your auction, and you give them all that info on what's missing, what's in the box, all that stuff. You'd be upfront about it. You don't want people handing it back to you next week. Yeah. Yeah, no, the auctions the auctions are tough, uh, and especially depends on the crowd you you get to your auction. There, there, there are two mm -hmm. different kinds of charity auctions, uh, and I've experienced both in in various uh, formats. Um, I mean, if you go to you know a big name charity auction where the point of the event is the charity, mm -hmm. then you get people, people oftentimes who are there to spend money. They come. It's much like a casino in that way, right? Mm -hmm. They are coming there with five hundred dollars, and they are going to leave with zero dollars, and that is the goal. They mm -hmm. may leave with something as, as well, but they are there to spend money for the charity and give to the to the mm -hmm. you know the charity and the and the cause. Uh, whereas in a lot of these other auctions, you know, in, in some of the things like sometimes Extra Life, uh, you've got gamers there who are there to play games and look for deals mm -hmm. and they don't have $500 to spare. They no. have, you know, $40 that they'd really like to stretch out and, and get yeah. the most for. It's, and, it's $40 for their whole entire weekend that's got to cover food, gaming, and coffee. Right. right? And so, my, so they're looking for the deal. Yeah. I was going to say my tip for running is to try and have that mix of the rare high value items and the bottom dollar deals so that you know you can get a good mix and yeah like we'll, we'll, we'll toss in like gamer keychains and pokemon and things like that yeah. and yeah. Uh, promo cards and like you know five dollar items so for the people that buy much money and i guess say all right we usually get both we'll get people there with uh, the money in their pocket they're there to spend and we'll get the people there who didn't show up with any money even though it's a charity event yeah and, and you really have to sort of balance it and and hope that you get enough of the people who have the money to spend to make mm -hmm. the, the a massive amount of time and effort you've put into the pricing and yep. the, the, the labeling and, and the organizing of it, um, you know, worthwhile for the charity because you're not getting anything out of it. <laughs> it's yeah, like, if it's donated, you, you are donating your time as well. Running yeah. a charity auction is a topic in and of itself. Yeah, true. Yeah. Fact, well, <laughs> if anyone wants to hear us cover <laughs> running a charity auction, send your question to questions at tabletoplop.com. We'll throw it on the list. All right, well, that's it for our discussion on the best ways to get rid of your unwanted games. We're going to head over to the lobby now to see what the awesome folk gathered here have been talking about while we were talking. All right, so what I want to see here is uh, what have people done? What have they done? What do their local stores offer? What, what kind of things have people done to get rid of games? So uh, Pennywise in the chat was mentioning that they would load up bags full of games and go to a place about three and a half hours away because they could get store credit uh, and use that to buy newer games to try yeah. out. No, totally legit. You know, if, you Very can, if you can get the store credit, and a lot of places yeah. are going to offer you a better rate for store credit than they would if they were just giving you cash to walk away. Yes. Yeah, no, actually, that's a really good tip when you're selling anything anywhere like <laughs> like i i sold i i kind of regret it now because we probably could have done a better deal but at one point i had an extensive toy collection because i was a spoiled brat and 
selling that actually paid for my gaming hobby for many years. And I would go to a place called the Classic Comic and Card Center in Livonia, Michigan. And I would give them one transformer and walk out with booster boxes of CCGs, usually a spawn action figure, because for some reason I was trading my toys for more toys, which I don't quite understand that one now. And like an RPG rule book. And like, like I, I, I think I tried every ccg that came out in the 90s because of selling them this stuff because i started running out of things to buy i'm like i have everything i want but i'll get more for store credit so how much how about you give me all the battle tech uh mech warrior collectible card game boxes you've got for this copy of uh rodimus prime and they're like oh yeah sure so it's definitely worth asking for store credit even the local store does give more for store credit whether that's for cards or anything else yeah absolutely that's a real lot um now, Pennywise also saying using for, uh, Facebook board game groups to sell on yeah. Facebook, uh, not not to sell, but only to buy. So there's mm -hmm. always an option to use to sell games if he calls more. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. Facebook groups have worked out really well uh, so far. The, the thing, too, is like Windsor's not that big and there are two main local game stores well three now i guess there's three local game stores now i forgot about that we have three local game stores now and it's the same people that go to all of them right so it's most of the time i know the people that are in the groups which is an added bonus the disadvantage is they know me and i have a reputation now where no one wants to buy my games because they're like why is mo selling it it must be bad and i'm like no i have like a thousand games they're not bad i just have better ones <laughs> and they don't quite always get oh, that so much space which is one of the reasons i actually wanted the store to be local consignment because i didn't want my name on the box because people wouldn't know they were coming from me so they wouldn't be like well mo doesn't like it what's wrong with it yeah no it's a, everyone it's has a, the same taste as me it's a real problem uh you know when especially when you have uh a reputation of any sort i mean it could yeah. be a good reputation or a bad reputation a reputation is going to color the pricing period yes. uh one way up down left right uh prevent it completely uh mm -hmm. it's just it's something that's going to affect you so if you can use the store to essentially anonymize those transactions, yeah. uh, it's, it makes it, it makes life easier that way. Uh, Ryan was commenting while we were talking about uh, yard sales. You know, everyone mm -hmm. wants to be the one to discover the treasure and pay nothing for it oh, at yeah. the yard sale. That's what uh, that's, that's what yard selling is all about. It's that, an that is what it's all about. Uh, so, so I said, I will admit, if you are going to try a yard sale, you can get away by having one table. We'll say of highly priced items that people seem to tolerate you'll still get some people in your face about even doing that but you can tend to get away with that but don't mix it in with everything else and don't try to only sell collectibles and watch it <laughs> yes. watch yes. it like a hawk yes. put put that your cat make that your cash box well, the other thing too is like we, we were selling collectible toys at the time parents letting their kids play with everything we're like no that's a 300 dollars transformer don't let your six-year-old put it in their mouth yeah yeah, well, yeah no, there's there, there's a lot of problems with yard sales yeah, our overall suggestion is don't, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Like, unless you don't care. Like I said, instead of throwing it in the trash, you had that flood, you got that hungry, hungry hippos with no you marbles left. literally want $2 a game, and that's better than nothing, and yeah. there if you go. You, if you get to that point, <laughs> yeah. feel free. Even uh, then, though, I'd almost say donate. I know. Cause yeah, the, the only, them. my only caveat with donating would be do pay attention to the charities. Uh, you know, charities yes. have different... Uh, ways of, of doing business and they those may or may not uh coincide with how your your feelings on things yeah. so just make sure you know what's yeah, happening who's, who's being benefited and, and all that uh you know before you you pick where you want those games to go to yeah uh, the library is safe but uh you know if if there's a a storefront run by some organization do your you know do your due diligence yeah, to make sure your you're okay diligence. with that Find out where the money goes. Yeah. Find out what they support. Uh, Ryan, support. Ryan has now uh, participated in first and second math trades in the oh, past nice. week. So he's, well, I guess uh, they, he's math excited trades are it. definitely worth it. Um, so one of the things I did notice he mentioned, I don't think I see is here, is there are two types. So there are ship math trades and no ship math trades. You generally want to do the no ship because you have no clue where you're going to send this stuff. That's the thing with a math trade. You you were like, I got six games from one person, so I only have to ship to one person. No, your six games are going to six different people, right? Like that's yeah. how part of how math trades work. Yeah, and, and, actually, and there's nothing good about shipping. No. <laughs> yes, there is shipping nothing is just good pain. about shipping. I actually worked at a library for years, and I have feelings about library donations because they don't necessarily always go where you intend them to go. So I feel like if you really want your board games 
to be at that library, maybe talk to a librarian or someone that works there. Don't just drop off a giant box and assume they're going to keep them. They may just go home with staff or in, end up in the rummage sale. And if yep. that's going to hurt your heart, don't do it. Yep. No, absolutely. That That's a valid. Yeah. You, whatever you're doing, you don't necessarily just want to show up randomly with a box of stuff. Yeah. Uh, no matter who you're giving it away to, even if it's mm -hmm. even if you're donating it to the local grade school and you think, oh, they're going to love this. Well, call them and check first. Um, because maybe there's some reason they can't, maybe, you know, there are all sorts of strange rules and regulations, even in non-pandemic times. So mm -hmm. if you're going to donate something, uh, you know, unless they, unless they've got a big sign up saying, drop your stuff here, big call. All right. We got a bunch more stuff from Ryan. You want to just fire through these? Sure. Ryan, Ryan had a, a list of stuff that he's been, uh, yeah, which is pretty of, awesome. of different things he's done. So he's given boxes of games to family to get them into the hobby. Yeah, that's which an is, awesome think, you know, again, that's the, the pass it, pass it on, pass it forward, extend the mm -hmm. hobby, uh, ship box of games to a game store for credit. Again, we know store credit now, hard to beat. I uh, know cool stuff Inc. actually in the U S buys games and cards where you just mail them to them and then they give you store credit. And they are some of the best prices online for shopping. We have a, one of the local gamers, Will Chamberlain's usually in the chat. It's not in there tonight. Uh, that's how he pays for his board game hobby was he got rid of his magic collection to cool stuff. And he had a significant enough collection that the last time I talked to Jamie, he still hasn't paid for a game because he had that much magic credit. Like he played seriously. He played tournaments. He had mocks. Was that where it was through? Was yeah, it was CSI. Yeah. Cool stuff. Inc. He had and, sent and it all to the US. You know, I'm surprised there's not more of that because I knew oh, with like electronics, there's a few different organizations where you send them their like your, your used electronics and they give you yeah. uh, credit, credit and you can yeah. buy, buy new electronics and stuff that way. Uh, not so much in Canada, but in the States especially, there's a few different groups um that were heavily advertising on podcasts for a while which is how i know about them uh and cool. it was just you know they'll send you a they'll send you a an envelope and you send them your you send it to them like you, even the shipping was easy on in, uh for that so, sort of stuff right. uh he also he sold games in the game market at calgary convention again we yeah. thought going to conventions cons. seem uh, to have all every convention i've been to had something yep some sort of some sort of little you know either mm -hmm. either trade or sale or or a way to get things yeah uh, again, we've, he's done a couple of math trades, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, sold games at bring and buy auction at a local convention. Yeah. That's a fantastic thing. Another another great way that conventions can can help out. Uh, and gave games to the local game society library. Yeah, you know, if you've got a local gaming club that has a library, that is a great place to donate. Because games. you'll still be able to play it if you want exactly. to. But yeah. so will anybody else who yeah. wants to, to to get involved there. Uh, it's traded unopened game for unopened games at stores. Great. That's a good one to do if you get a gift. Yeah, no, absolutely. You, you get you, a gift. You know, you know, post Christmas. You know, June <laughs> thinks that Harry Potter Funko verse is really cute, but you're really into Warhammer 40k. You might be able to turn uh, Voldemort into some Terminators. And he mentions he tried to sell some games on Kijiji without success, though there was some interest. Well, I think yeah, that's sort of the definition of Kijiji. Yeah. Uh, not much success, <laughs> but a lot of interest. <laughs> We, we've successfully done it a couple times, but yeah, Kijiji, I bought more than I've sold. Yeah, I, I, I've done a couple of uh, purchases on Kijiji, and honestly, they have all felt really dirty and sketchy almost every yeah, time. Yeah, I got, yeah, some, some <laughs> of the, I, I've gotten video game system stuff, so I've gotten yeah, controllers, controllers and retro systems, what and, and the, 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 for a while I was getting Xbox controllers, like, that. I, I don't know where they came from. Well, I mean, I, I, I didn't picked up. Ask. I picked up those games for you. Um, you did that. Yes. You, you did that one thing. And it's this house that um, seems to probably actually not be occupied as a house, but well, it's full yeah. of product. Um, and there happened well, to be some games. Well, that one was legit. That, that, that had to do with uh, someone's parent passing yeah. away. And but but there's a few like of those that, where yes. I've been to. Where it's where you, you stop by. And I mean, I'm a big guy, so I'm not as careful as... I recommend yeah. other people should be, uh, but you stop by the house and it's sort of like, oh, your this this house is just a front for people selling things mm. that may well have fallen off a truck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, this no one is living in this domicile. Uh, but uh, yeah, and then he uh, he sold a box of BattleTech CCG cards to someone in the U.S. for the cost of shipping. Yeah, <laughs> I've done that. Yeah. I bought something like I, I shipped that once. I'm like, anyone want this? I'll do you just gotta pay shipping. And I've gotten games that way too. Um that went back in the G plus days. That actually was relatively common. 
but because it was common, more people did it, right? Right. So then one of those pay it forward things. Although shipping these days is not something you get. It's only yeah, but it's the buyers now. paying it. Yeah, yeah, but no, but I mean, right, like particularly right now during yeah. we aren't talking about pandemic generally, but in the pandemic times, shipping yeah. is no. ugly. No shipping, um, thank you. I, I, I literally Although we're I, gonna ship stuff in three weeks. I uh I got I got I got something for my son's birthday recently. Uh and it shipped in the from Canada Post from literally 40 minutes down the road. I could have driven there and back and back probably there and back in under an hour. And it took eight days to get to my house <laughs> from the time Canada Post picked wow. it up to the time they put it in my mailbox. Eight days. Um so it's a it's an interesting time we're living in right now. That's uh, the last thing Ryan notes is Starlight Citadel, which is a store that took games for credit, is closed. I didn't know that. That's a store I know of. Their their prices weren't great for buying, but it was one of the few places you could buy used games online in Canada. Right. All right. I think we're pretty good here. Um, one last note: if you're selling RPGs, another one is half price books. Half price books in the states is great for buying RPGs. Or in, in box sets and stuff like that. They may or may not buy board games depending on your local store. I've heard both. Most people say they do not do board games because they're too worried about missing components. But books from RPGs, they seem to be more than willing to buy. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. And Abe is Abe a books. great source for pricing. And you yes. can sell on there too, but it you have to have a, a large quantity to be able to be selling on there. So. Yeah, so Abe Books is an aggregate that aggregates prices from local book, uh, from um independent bookstores mm -hmm. that um yeah. do used sorry not like no chapters indigo but um used bookstores and they aggregate so it's a, especially for rpgs a good way to find prices they you can sometimes find a board game on there but i find the board games tend to be no the board games ridiculous. are ridiculous they shouldn't <laughs> yeah. be listed like they shouldn't be listed and they're like 300 dollars each RPGs. right but yeah. yeah rpgs definitely a books abe.com i think yep Excellent. Well, that's it for our main topic tonight. Remember, you can find lots of gaming topics and advice like this over on the blog at bell, tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on gaming advice at the top of the page. We also want to thank Deanna for joining us for this segment of the show and sharing her expertise on the topic. Now, finally, as usual, if you've got a game or game night question for us, all you got to do, go over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or send me an email, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Up next, a look at Bastille from Queen Games. Queen Games provided us with a review copy of this game. No other compensation was provided. Uh, Bastille was designed by Christopher Christoph Bear and features art by David Cockard. It was released at Essen 2018 by Queen Games. It plays three or four players, and a game takes uh, about an hour. For a look at what you get in the box, be sure to check out our Bastille unboxing video on YouTube. There'll be a link to that in our show notes. Now, I don't have the time here to go through each component in detail, and that's probably going to happen with anything, uh, any Euro game like this, right? There's a lot of bits. If you do want to see everything you get, it's on the YouTube video, or you can go over to the blog post. But what I have to say here is I was extremely impressed by the component quality uh, in Bastille here. Like Queen Games is known for making high quality games and Bastille is no exception. This is some of the best designed and layout I've seen in a game uh, with clear, large iconography used throughout and just little touches like a color-coded board that matches a similarly color-coded rule book. Well, from the game's description, it's the eve of the French Revolution, and you are the leader of a revolutionary group trying to best position your faction to be ready for when the revolution inevitably begins. To do so, you need money, influence, revolutionary leaders, weapons to arm them, and more. The timing of this review is actually somewhat amusing, as Bastille Day, to commemorate the storming of the Bastille, was July 14th. That was yesterday. We should have recorded this yesterday. <laughs> I know. But enough about messy reality. How about you give us an <laughs> overview of play in the game Bastille? All right. To start a game of Bastille, put the board out, put out four random characters, put out a stack of Versailles tiles on the Versailles spot, uh, flip one face up, put a number of weapons in the Bastille uh, based on the number of players, stack the mission cards, and then put out the bonus tiles, one for each round, and flip up the one for round one. 
Now, players are going to take their bits, and you are going to have a set of influence tiles, uh, the exact numbers of which are based on the number of players. A scoring tile, which is if you happen to lap the board, you get to put that out. Henchman cubes and eight coins. Uh, you get two meeples. One's going to go at the start of the scoring track, and another is going to go on a track that circles the Bastille, known as the Bastille track. You're going to draw the top card from the mission deck, which gives you an endgame scoring goal. Now, a game of Bastille is played over eight rounds. Each round is broken into three phases. Now, first, you're going to place those influence tiles out. Then the locations on the board are resolved in numeric order. And then there's this flag scoring phase. In addition to that, there are two scoring rounds. One happens at the end of round four, and another one happens at the end of the game. So basically, you've got 26 steps to complete the game if you include those scoring rounds from start yep. to finish. Sounds about right. I don't think I ever counted them or did the math. <laughs> uh, first thing you do is place your influence token. So in turn, you're going to choose one of your tokens and place it on one of the locations in Paris on the board. Uh, each of the locations has room for either two up to four influence tokens, depending on the spot. Most spots only hold two. Some only hold up to four. Once a spot's taken, no one else can place in that spot. And you always have to make sure you play left to right. And the reason for that is that ties are broken based on who placed first. Uh, interestingly enough, players can play multiple place, multiple tokens to the same place if they are available. Now, once you've all placed your tokens, you're now going to go through starting at location one, going to location seven, and evaluate them. The way they're evaluated is the person who placed the highest number influence token there is the one that gets to activate the location, gets to do the thing followed by the player with the second highest influence and then third highest influence, fourth highest influence. Now, again, no, you could be first and second. So it could be the same player that has these spots or more often it's different. Again, ties are awarded to the player who went there first. So the person furthest to the left. So players are bidding for the right to take actions on the board with the player bidding the most, getting some form of additional advantage yep. uh, or first if, if in case of a tie. Yeah, or placed first, yeah. So if you play the same influence, if you both have threes, the person who played the three first is going to get the bonus. Now, deciding what influence token to place where is a big part of Blastille. And also, not only where, but when. Making sure, like, looking at what everyone else has. So this is another game. This is a game where everything is open information. You're not hiding anything. There's no player screens. You always see exactly how much money everyone has, what characters they've hired, and how much influence they have. Now, I at first, I was going to sit here and go through all of the seven locations, but you know what? That's going to take us another 20 minutes. So if you want a breakdown of every location, you're going to have to check out the blog because I don't want to spend too much time on it here. But basically, there are spots that get you more money, spots that let you improve your influence tokens, a spot to collect bonuses, like you can get extra points, move on the pastel track, get some torches. Torches are wild card weapons you want to collect and so on. There's the catacombs, where this one's kind of neat because you place little cubes. They represent your henchmen going into the catacombs underneath Paris. And they may come out during the scoring round to get you bonuses. There's a spot to hire characters, so you're, you're building your revolutionary army, and you place those in your tableau. Then there's the Bastille itself, which I mentioned earlier is a track. So you can go up on that track, and you're going to get points during the scoring round based on how far you're up that track. And the Bastille also determines which order you get to grab weapons. So it's an important track to being up. The last place just lets you get mission cards, which are end game scoring. So it's really interesting because this is essentially in many ways a dry, boring Euro, except mm. they have managed to tie the theme in with this dry, boring Euro to take it to another level that you mm. don't normally expect from a lot of these cube pusher type games. No, I totally agree on this one. I uh, think again, if you get into the details, like you get the money, you go to the bank. Like the, the the locations are tied to what you get from them, and it just makes sense. So next is the final stage. I mentioned this before. It's called flag scoring. All this is is you look at your citizens. Whoever has the most French flags gets a bonus for having it, and then the person with the second most flags gets another bonus. Now, once you get to turn four, you're halfway through the game, right? Four out of eight rounds. You're going to do an interim scoring round. Now, players are going to get points for a number of things. Uh, the number of gems on the characters they've collected, having the most crowns on the characters they collected, how far they are around the Bastille track. And then that cool catacombs thing happens. So I do want to explain this because I think it's a neat thing. So what happens is you've got this bag where you've been putting in henchmen throughout the game. Well, during the scoring round, you pull out five cubes. And then when each cube's pulled out, the player gets some kind of reward. And there's like two different catacomb boards and you pick 
which reward it is. And depending on the level of the reward, you're either going to get to put the guy back in the catacomb, the, the henchman back in the catacomb, or you just take the reward and they're considered gone for the rest of the game. So there's a little bit of a push your luck element there. Then after you've done the catacomb phase, you do get to take weapons from the best deal. So again, the person who's in front is going to get two weapons. The next person is going to get two weapons. And the person who's in last only gets one weapon. So the catacombs aspect is another really interesting one because the catacombs of Paris have played such a huge role in mm -hmm. the city's history, including throughout the, uh, the storming of the Bastille and, and preparations to and the revolution itself. Uh, but they aren't straightforward. I mean, they yeah. are catacombs. They are a maze beneath the city. So the risk reward aspect even is very on point for the theme. Yeah. So we play four more rounds, right? We get to the eighth round and we do some end game scoring. It's very similar to the first game scoring. Uh, one of the things you do have to do here is rearrange your characters. So there are three types of characters. There's peasants, soldiers, and nobles. And you have to group them into groups. So all your peasants go together, all your soldiers go together, all your noblemen go together. And you also have monks. And monks are wild cards. They can join one of the other groups. This is all very important for the end game scoring cards. Then once you got your groups together, you need to arm your troops. So this is where you assign the weapons. And again, it's paired up. So the peasants need pitchforks. The soldiers need rifles and the nobles need rapiers. Now, torches count as wild cards. So torches are really valuable because you can give them to anyone. Then you're going to look at your tableau of characters and you're going to get a bunch of points for them. So you're going to get points for the gems on them, whoever has the most crowns, how far you've gone on that Bastille track. The Actually, every character card gives you a set number of points just for collecting them. Then you're going to go through your mission cards and see if you've completed any of them. Again, those are endgame scoring cards. And then your coins that you have left. Now, again, you're going to explore the catacombs. The difference here is the rewards are slightly more limited because you're at the end of the game. So there's certain things that just aren't worth doing. And they're bigger rewards and you don't get your henchmen back. Now, the henchmen that are still left in the bag are actually still worth something. They are going to be worth one point each for every henchman that was still in the bag. So throwing your henchmen in the bag, even if they don't come out during two of the, the two scoring rounds, they still got you something. Finally, you look at your characters and you try to figure out if you left anyone unarmed because you don't want unarmed characters during a revolution. You are going to lose a number of points based on how many characters are unarmed at the end of the game. And this can be huge. If you have five or more characters unarmed, you're losing 20 points in a game that usually scores around 50 to 70. After this, the player with the most points win the game. Ties broken with the player with the most coins. Any future ties are a shared victory. All right, well, that's the technical aspects. Now let's talk about what works or doesn't work. All right, so when I brought Bastille home from Origins 2019, I honestly had no clue to expect. Uh, for anyone who wants the story, listen to previous episodes where I explained exactly where this game come from and why I brought it home. Now, one thing I did expect from this game is high quality presentation and components. This is a trademark of Queen Games. I don't, ex I expect Queen Games to look and look great. And this is... A step above that in a way this is one of the best designed games i've ever played in regards to not the mechanics not that the mechanics are bad but like the layout the the design of the board the iconography the colors used like this not only helps with information dissemination during play easily being able to see stuff like from across the table but it also helps when teaching the game to new players because everything's right there and easy to see it's, it's always so fantastic when you've got a game that helps you help yourself with great design and visual cues to just mm -hmm. help things move along. Now, the other highlight for me with Bastille is the, the mechanics. The, it's, it's a mix of auction bidding with worker placement. Because placing an influence token on a spot is obviously worker placement. But by putting it there, you're actually bidding that amount of influence from your pool of influence to take that action. And then the next player, if they have a bigger influence token can outbid you and you may not get what you wanted. And I think that's really fascinating. That combination of bidding and worker placement, this whole influence system just works really well and opens up some very interesting decision points and timing the, the, the mix of where do I want to go? Do I want to go there first? Um, do I want to see what someone else bid before I go there? All of those are fascinating decisions to make. Yeah, and it has some real thematic linkage, again, with the factions in the French underground putting their own reputations on the line in order to draw greater support into their faction and, and you know, take the, take the lead when it came to storming the Bastille. 
Now, there are downfalls, of course. Uh, no game is perfect. And the one I have found, the biggest downfall when playing over multiple games of Bastille is the interaction of the character deck, how it's distributed. So it is a deck of different characters, and they are split into A, B, C. And you shuffle the C deck, and you put that on the bottom, then the B deck and the A deck on top. And the order the characters come out in that is very important. And misunderstanding that can lead to players thinking they're going to be able to do something and score something and not be able to because a card's already out of the deck. So, uh, or totally misinterpreting the end game scoring where you're looking at the scoring, thinking you need a series where instead you need a set as an example, I, without showing you the cards and getting into any details. Uh, these idiosyncrasies have caused the game to fall somewhat flat. Like I, I no one I've taught the game has had a horrible experience but I've had a few, meh, it was okay feeling on the first game because of people not grasping how that character deck ties to the end game scoring deck, the mission deck. I see this this immediately as I was reading through this reminded me of some of my experiences with Card Kings of Valeria, which mm -hmm. is a game I love right up until that scoring round when it turns out that I have completely misread my end game scoring card and was collecting the wrong thing and have lost. Yeah. And that is literally what happened to Deanna the first time she played Best Deal. She aimed for a certain strategy and then collected a certain set of character to score big points and got nothing because she misinterpreted how a card was read. Now, I will say, Queen tried, right? They tried to help. They gave you this reference card. But as a new player to this game, this thing's intimidating as heck. Like, this is a lot of information in one play. It's just overwhelming. And I got to say, most people, players that aren't going to, they're not going to take the first play of a game seriously enough to deep dive this reference list to look up, oh, well, when does the seven peasant come out versus the three? And when does that going to matter? And how many of each card is in the mission deck and things like that, right? And well, what this all means is that for players to really grok and enjoy Bastille, you need to play the game, in my opinion, at least twice. And I guess say two tends to be enough. And the problem with that is today's board game culture is very much one and done. You play a game once, you have the experience, you move on to the next experience. And I have a feeling with Bastille, a lot of people are going to try this game. They're not going to deep dive it. And they're just going to be like, oh, eh, all right, let's move on. Yeah, I, I feel so strongly for game designers these days because they are being asked to design a game that is both sufficiently meaty and deep that you can get your hooks into as a heavy gamer, but also plays perfectly well the first time yeah. you sit down at it and i think those are pretty mutually exclusive goals mm -hmm. in many cases right no i agree and plus once you get into like a super heavy game people are willing to accept it right like when you're getting into a veen hose or a 4.5 or something crazy like that but steel is not that right this is a medium weight euro this is not a heavy game it's like a, a 2.8 it's a little bit above race for the galaxy it's it's not a heavy game and it plays in about an hour but there's those great decision points and that system mastery reward that comes with a heavier game. And I think people aren't going to expect that. Now, the whole thing is I've now played this a number of times. And the thing is, I know this now, right? I've I played enough that I know that there is this potential problem of players not understanding the important value of the character. Deck. So now I'll front load that, right? So if I am teaching this game, I will spend additional time going through each of the mission cards. I will literally flip out every card in the deck, explain the distribution and what each of them mean to make sure it's clear. And then I will take out the citizen deck and I will show how the A's are different than the B's. Now I won't go through every card. And then I will point to the reference sheet and repeatedly mention during the game, before grabbing a mission, you might want to check the reference sheet and make sure the characters you want aren't gone already, or they're still to come. And the other thing is you don't use every character every game. So parts of the C deck never come out. So again, knowing that, knowing that not every character is going to be coming out, you don't want to hinge your whole strategy on one thing. So what I do is I front load it, which, wow, has that greatly improved the initial gameplay experience. So when I taught this game to my sister-in-law and mother-in-law, they both, I, I don't know, but loved it. Like, I think Brenda really loved it because she has to come back and play it again, which is a really good sign. And she came back and we played three player. Um, Holly, I think, dug it. Like, she didn't complain about it, but they got it right? Like they knew how to do it. The problem is I'm not everywhere. I can't be there to teach everyone who plays Bastille this the first time they play. But it sounds to me like perhaps the instructions don't perhaps focus on these details enough. Yeah. 
Uh, if it takes someone who's got a few plays under their belt to be able to teach it properly, to maximize game enjoyment and success, that says a little bit something about not necessarily the, the quality of the rules, but just the, the organization and the, and the level of importance placed on certain aspects in the rules. So again, if you look at it, they gave you a summary sheet with this information specifically. Nothing else. There's no summary sheet of the bonus tiles. There's no summary sheet of the, just the character deck and the mission deck on a one-page sheet. So they obviously knew this was an issue or else right. they wouldn't have included that sheet. The problem is, like, who wants to deep dive a spreadsheet at the start of a game? And that's right. basically what it is, right? Like, it's got pretty pictures, but it's a spreadsheet. Right. Now, overall, I got to say I dig this game. Um, the, I admit my first play was rough. Uh, my first play with other people has been rough. My third play with new people was rough until I figured all this out, right? But I got to say there is a very solid game here that's doing something interesting and new. That whole mashup of worker placement with auctions, like with, with bidding. I wouldn't call it auctions. It's bidding. It's an auction bidding mechanic. Plus, this game just is so beautifully produced. Like, just some unique things. And I got to admit, this is probably not good for colorblind people. I don't know. But the fact the players' colors are the French flag. You got red, white, and blue, and then they threw in black. And like, just that little touches like that are just, that puts it over the top out of most things in my thing. And it is just that design and the fact all the scorings right on the board just makes it a joy to play. If you dig auction games or worker placement games, I think you got to give this one a try. Like find a way, like find, find a demo copy, try it at a con, see if your local game store will do a demo just to see it, just to see what they've done with these mechanics. If you are a fan of medium weight euros, like not heavy, but with enough thinking to them, like I think Catan fans might find a lot to like in here. I think you're going to dig this. All I ask is do not give up after one play. Like this is, is I I've seen it. I have seen people go from eh to, wow, that's actually really good. This one requires a bit of system mastery to shine. Now, one thing I see in reviews uh, uh, from people on BGG is um, it's Lancaster is little sibling. Um, okay. Why, why play this? If you can play Lancaster. I own both. I preferred Bastille. It has been a long time since I played Lancaster. I couldn't tell you exactly why off the top of my head. But okay. Lancaster, going back to last week's topic, is something Deanna and I literally discussed this weekend about getting rid of because it felt dated. Right. That was the biggest thing with Lancaster. It felt like an old Claus Tuber came out in the year like before 2000 or around 2000. Right. It's just something about that game felt dated. And that's one where you're placing knights on spots to do something and you can play higher knights to bump, which to me is different than multiple people bidding for a slot. Right. I don't know. Like, to be honest, I, I couldn't tell you exactly. Why? Because it's been so long. Lancaster is literally, we haven't purged it. It's, it's <laughs> one of those we're going to try again. Right. And to be honest, now I'm curious. Now that that's come up, if we do play Lancaster again, I'm going to have to be comparing it in my head to Bastille. Right. I mean, they're both queen games. Uh, you know, they, Lancaster, yeah. Lancaster is notably higher on the BGG rankings, but it's also been out longer. So, uh, you know, it's got, time. it's got the, uh, and it's, it's a slightly higher weight. It's a two point, it's a, it's a three to Bastille's 270. Two seven. I was close. It's so, two weeks. Yeah, yeah. I was close with that. Which again, you know, with our yeah <laughs> mid, it, it, mid range mid range that. heavy for us. Yeah. All right. Mid-range. Well, for a more in depth look at Bastille, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews, where you will see all the different areas and components. And now a look at season one, episode one of Escape Mail, an escape room game delivered to your home. We received a review copy of this episode of Escape Mail from Mobile Escape, and no other compensation was provided. All right, so Escape Mail is probably not one people have heard of before. This is this is uh, something different. I don't even, I, I, to me, it's still a tabletop game, but it's not your standard board game. This is a new escape room experience delivered by mail from a company called Mobile Escape. Uh, they are Canadian, located in Alberta, Canada, so thumbs up, Canadians. Uh, you can get a season one episode at a time. So you can just buy season one, episode one, or you can buy a bundle of all of them together, or you can actually get it as like one of those monthly boxes where they'll send you a new episode each month. Now, the cost of an individual episode is $14.99 Canadian, whereas the bundles cost $132 Canadian, which is a heck of a lot better than $180 if you bought them all separately. Now, Sean and I actually did some comparison shopping on this after checking it out, and this seems pretty much on par with similar mail order puzzle experiences. 
Yeah, now, if you want to take a look at what you get in this first episode of Escape Mail, I do encourage you to check out our Escape Mail unboxing video on YouTube. Now, in this video, I try to be really careful not to spoil anything. Uh, people have a various different levels of uh, acceptability for what they consider spoilers. So what I do is I open up the envelope. Everyone's going to see that. And then I get to a seal and I don't break that seal. And then I give everyone notice that I'm about to break that seal. So if you want, you can see that far and then turn the video off. But to be honest, I don't think seeing what's in this envelope is going to spoil anything. Like you're not going to see any of the puzzles. You're not going to see any clues. You're just going to see the bits that come in it. Yeah, I mean, short of literally pausing and staring and working out, figuring out things and, and you know, ch trying to catch things when he holds it up to the camera but it's yeah. only recorded at 720p anyway so <laughs> the the chances are you're not going to be able to spoil anything and even if we were to have mildly spoiled it it's only episode one of 12 True. and they offer bundles that don't even include episode one so if you would had felt it was spoiled <laughs> you can just go ahead and get the bundles episode two through 12 instead of episode one through yeah. 12 yeah i thought that was actually pretty brilliant so what I'll say here is, first off, I was surprised how much they shoved in one envelope. Like the envelope didn't look that thick, but I felt like I just kept pulling stuff out of it. It felt like a clown car. Like there's parts of a map, some twine, there's a shipping manifest, a scrap of parchment with marks on it that was like threadbare and falling apart and a bunch more. Again, I'm not going to go into all the details. Now, what I will say is the quality was a mixed bag. Like, all of it was pretty obviously like like someone threw this in their inkjet printer, right? Some of it was literally on paper. Some was on cardstock. There's no cardboard here. Like you're, we're not talking about punch outs or anything like that. Um, some of the bits were weathered and folded and they look kind of aged, right? Like they did the, the, the tricks. I don't think anything was soaked in tea, but it kind of had that look. But then others were not. Where like, like this literally like just looked like it was printed on an inkjet paper. Um, I can't say I was overly impressed, but you know what? I wasn't disappointed either. It was kind of what I expected from something someone sent in the mail. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's sometimes an authentic clue in a modern puzzle really could just be something someone zipped off on an inkjet these days. True. Uh, though I guess I would hope that as you get deeper into the seasons, things got a little bit more interesting for materials. And I got to say, looking ahead, it did look like it. I saw some much more 3D looking components looking on their website. Uh, the other thing that's worth noting is that you will need tape, you will need scissors, uh, you will need to destroy components in order to solve the puzzle, which means that each episode is a one and done. It's disposable. You're not going to be able to pass it on to your friend. Now, the other thing you require, which I thought was pretty interesting, is you need to have an email account and access to a web browser. Well, luckily, nothing that most people don't have regularly accessible. We should note that Escape Mail does market strongly to schools. So they do keep something in mind uh, that necessary. So, you know, it's going to be something that a student has accessible to them in most cases. So for the actual sitting down and playing the game, uh, we decided to invite Brenda, that's Deanna's mom, over to try it. Uh, she is a huge puzzle fan. Like out of our whole family, she's the one that, you know, goes to shoppers and picks up the Sudoku books and the logic puzzle books and that. And I thought she'd really enjoy the experience and also, well, be an asset if we got stuck because she's probably way better at puzzles than we are. One thing I found very interesting about this when I compare it to other escape room style games I've played is that there were no instructions. Like it literally just started immersed in the experience uh, with a note. This is something you're going to see as soon as you open the envelope. So I'm not spoiling anything here. Uh, it was obvious you're going to read this note from a family member and that's it. Like after that, I, it was not immediately obvious where to go. So at first, like the three of us were literally just like, here, let me see that. Let me see that. Hold this. Oh, look, this is underlined. Oh, what the heck does this mean? Like fumbling around trying to figure out how everything interconnected. Now, eventually I figured out the one trick, right. That kind of gave us some direction. And I got to admit finding that was like the first win of this thing. Like it was like, Oh, that felt good. I'm like, Oh, that's, that's the thing that tells you what to do. I felt good finding that. And that feels like an authentic escape room experience to me. Uh, you know, if you go into a commercial escape room, you know, more or less what your end goal is. You need to escape or, you know, fire a gun, fire off the cannon or, you know, find the spy. But, you have no idea what form it's going to take between okay. here and there or what you might experience on the path to get there. And finding that starting point 
is often part of the uh, game. See, that's cool to hear. See, my, my experience has been with the Exit series, and I've seen the Unlock series. I haven't done one myself, and they are very clear about what you're looking for and what to do. Like, they're, here are your cards, and here's what you're looking for on the cards, and here you're going to do this, and here's the code wheel, and a very clear direction. Like, it has a rule book, for, uh, like a board game, where this did not. So that, it's interesting to know that this is actually closer to a real escape room experience. Now, interestingly, at least I thought it was, uh, during that initial confusion, there was a particular uh, project that Brenda started working on that was a step above what was actually required. So this was a word-based puzzle, and she had gotten it about 75%, maybe an 80% solved. Then we found another clue that gave us a cipher that would have made solving that entire thing very easy from the start. So I thought it was amusing that we had almost solved like the hard, we almost did it on hard, like we almost skipped a step. Yeah, and some people are just dedicated puzzle solvers. And just because a cipher helps doesn't mean there may not be another mm -hmm. path to get to that same solution. Now, I guess I, looking at the, the experience as a whole, I think I found the difficulty to be just about right. Uh, this said difficulty regular, whatever that means. Uh, we did get stumped a few times, but never long enough that it got frustrating. Uh, we definitely didn't give up on anything. There also weren't any puzzles that were just glaringly obvious. There was never the, oh, obviously this goes here. Everything took at least a bit of thought. Uh, I figure our total time to solve everything was probably just under an hour, which I think sounds about right for this style of game. Yeah, and that sounds like a pretty fulfilling escape room experience without the concern for pandemics and cleanliness. <laughs> that too. Now, one aspect I didn't like was the technological aspect. The fact that, like, yes, we knew you need an email address on a web browser. Well, obviously, you're going to email someone, right? Like, that's just obvious. Why would I need an email address if I'm not going to email anyone? And it just, having to do that, I, like, it was done well enough, but it felt like it took us out of the game. Like, uh, just to fight the fact that, that we knew this and, and the letter, something that the letter, the language used, the, the, the names used just made me feel like we were like in an Indiana Jones. Like this was back in the past. It was like the 1940s. We were on some kind of like treasure hunt. Right. And I just pictured like the family member that wrote us to be like Indiana or like uh, professor Jones or something like, I don't know. I just pictured something totally different. And I can say that this is definitely modern. And uh, seeing that end, I just for some reason had a craving for craft beer. It, it took some twists that I think I, I feel safe in saying were budget related. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, which does lead me to the most disappointing part of this entire endeavor, which was the reward at the end, the payoff. While all of us had fun puzzling things out and getting to the final answer, that payoff, I will say, is lame. Like, like I, I'm tempted to just like drop a link in chat and spoil it here so other people know what to expect here, but I won't. I'll be good. I will just say that it wasn't what I was expecting. Uh, it was very poorly produced uh, and rather corny. Uh, and, and I got to say, did not make me want to order episode two. Now, I've seen what we've discussed in here. I didn't take part in the escape room, but I have seen the link. Uh, yeah. And if it were to represent the entirety of the season... I might start to question the value. Though, as we've pointed out, the activities and puzzles were yeah. certainly well-formed. Uh, and it's one of those things where you almost, they almost might have been better off without including that last portion. If, if that yeah. payoff hadn't been there at all, oh, it might've definitely. been a better experience yep. because you wouldn't have had the letdown. And that's one of those things where at a real escape room, every, the fact that you finish and the door opens is is the great part. Yeah. You don't need the story to be completed anymore. You have escaped. That's the win. Uh, and they've they've gone to that next step as a as a you know continuity thing, I think. Uh, and it it hurt. Now Deanna is also pointing out that it also broke the story in a way. I don't know if I want to read off what she's saying because it's getting a little spoilier. Uh, basically, you were trying to work with a family member to do something and they were looking for help. But the end was them going, yeah, yeah, you figured it out too, which is kind of weird because I thought they were looking for help. So there was a story disconnect there as well. Right. But like to be honest, I think Sean's right. I think if the end result was that it just led to by the next season, might have actually felt better than what we did get. Right. Now, overall, I don't, I don't know. I have mixed feelings. I'd say all three of us enjoyed the experience. Um, the most fun actually was that initial confusion when you just have all this stuff in front of you and you're like, I don't even know. 
And like, there were some things we picked up and managed to get something out of. And we're like, oh, but what the heck does that mean? And like noticing some of the, the bits of clues that you put together later. Like, remember, we noticed this. Uh, there was the puzzles were difficult enough that you felt solving them, right? That's part of the reward of puzzles, right? Is you get that, yeah, I'm a smart, I got it. Uh, the solving the puzzles was fun. I just, ah, that reward, like, I, I don't know. Um, I didn't pay for this. So I, I, maybe I'd feel different if I had put out hard earned cash for this too. And then saw that end. Cause that end game here was lacking. Like, it, again, it didn't make me want to try the next episode. So looking at the value, right? So for $22 Canadian or less, if there's a sale, I can get a complete story and a complete experience from one of the exit games from Cosmos. I've reviewed those on the blog. If you want to see about them, there's two of them we've reviewed there. Whereas for escape mail, if I want to get the full story, if I want to see all of season one, I got to spend over $130. And that's only if I buy the one time. If I start buying them separate, I can spend $180. I got to say $180 buys an awful lot of exit games. But now at the same point, uh, you're getting uh, what I, I'm trying to compare here. When you look at the, the, the number of puzzles, um, is it an exit game versus one of these one of these episodes? Is it about two episodes for an exit game? sort of comparison Ooh. exit games have a lot of puzzles like uh you're looking at 13 puzzles on average. okay so you're looking so you're looking almost three episodes for an exit game okay yeah that that's a I'm, I'm trying to remember i think the last one we played went up to an end deck that's, right. a, that's a, an estimate i'd have to check our reviews so yeah you're looking at about 13 puzzles I, to me, it's it's that full story. It's that full reward. It's that I get a full experience as opposed to a cliffhanger that makes me wanting more. Right. I can definitely see people like this. Like, like to be honest, this is something I'm like, that might be a good gift for Brenda because she really enjoyed the puzzle aspects. Right. So that's something to consider. But I'll admit, I'm not going to be picking up the next episode. Now, they, what they do do, which is kind of cool, is as Sean mentioned, now that I've tried episode one, I could buy a bundle with two and on which means you can easily without much investment just buy episode one without having to worry. Now you got to buy the full bundle. They have priced it that way, which I think is cool. Yeah. All right. Well, for a more in-depth look at this first episode of escape mail, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews. And now the bellhops tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables. Yeah, we like to do this every week. We take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, which hasn't happened in a long time, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. I gotta say, it was a good week for me here. This was a, this was a good one with lots of in-person gaming. So, uh, And that's with canceling one game night. We were supposed to get together one more time before we got the Bastille review out. I was hoping to play it once more with three people. Uh, it didn't happen, but I don't think I would have discovered anything new. Uh, so my week actually started last Thursday. So just after we recorded, which was a three-player game of Best Deal, uh, this was, was, was uh, with Brenda, Deanna, and I, and this went extremely well. Uh, this was my first time playing with three, and I am pleased to say the game worked just as well at three as with four. Uh, Deanna noted she actually preferred it at three because with four players, you only get two, three influence tokens, so you only get to do three actions every round, whereas with three players, you get four tokens, so you get four actions every round, so... That's a lot more actions over the whole game. Interestingly, uh, BGG is is saying that it's best at four as voted by the people. But if you actually click through, it is a tie. And for whatever oh, reason, it had, they have come out and said four. But it is exactly the same number of votes for three and four. I personally think I preferred it at four because there was more competition over spots. And I like that interaction. So there you go. You get a split here. I, I'd <laughs> say four. She'd say three. Uh, up next comes a rather interesting two-player game of Katana, actually a couple of them. So last time I talked about Katana, this is that um, samurai fighting sword, sword fighting game, card game with some really beautiful cards. I know that we had a number of rules questions that came up and how awesome it was the designer had answered all of them. Heck, they even went so far as to publish an official FAQ based on my questions, which I was so happy to see because unfortunately this game needs an FAQ. So when we sat down to play this, I just fully expected to sit down and be able to dive in because we've had all our questions answered, right? But sadly, that was not the case. Uh, the first step of the game is you get a hand of Kami cards, three of them, and you're going to pick one. And I looked at mine, and I was like, oh, no. And Deanna looked at hers like, oh, no. And we both had a question about one of the Kami in our hands. 
So that's a little rough. So surprisingly enough, despite the fact it's like 1130 at night, our time, I don't know where Tracy is. I was able to get in touch with Tracy, Tracy Allen, the designer of the game. And I got a hold of him on Instagram and he was awesome about answering our questions, which is a good thing because as the game went on, we had a lot of them. Like I thought we had a lot the first time, like we had about a dozen questions over two plays. And like a few of these were things we probably could have guessed extrapolated from the rules, but there were definitely things that were not covered anywhere in the rule book. Now I do have to thank Tracy for being there with us while we played, because that was awesome. We were able to finish our games because if he wasn't, I, we might've just given up. Yeah, no, it's while I truly do appreciate Tracy helping out and being there in a way you don't often see from designers the reviews on Board Game Geek indicate that he's had to be there for players, often answering many questions for the Kickstarter backers to, uh, when they when they receive received their copies and started playing, and as well as it just seems helping people muddle through a rule book that unfortunately just wasn't complete. No. Now, additionally, this actually shows some real problems with reviewers out there who didn't find any of these problems or comment on them, or at least didn't reach out to Tracy and tell him if there were problems. And this is the real reason why we haven't released a review on this game yet, because we haven't gotten the plays in to really determine the quality yeah. of the game. We have, so, it's yeah, not just one and out. Yeah, that's that's the one thing. I We are going to, I expect to review this game next week. This will, this will be part of our 100th episode. We're going to celebrate by reviewing Katana. Uh, it just happens to fall at the same time. I, again, though, I need at least one more play. Like, I'm hoping for more than one. I'm hoping for two or three more plays with now having all the rules. Like, we've yet to sit down and play a full game not having a rule question. So it's hard to review the game without just saying you can't play it. But, like you could extrapolate many of the answers from the rules, but there were a few things that came up where we're like, I don't know, like we would have had to just make something up. And uh, it seems like Tracy's he's uh, out Portland way, or at least was originally from Portland. But he may oh, not be there now, enough. but he's, he's from Portland. So he's got that time zone advantage on you. Uh, that's what it is. That's why he was still up. All right. Next I got jaws from Prospero hall and Ravensburger for the table for the first time since extra life. Uh, this was the first time I'd ever even really seen the game because she was so busy at Extra Life, she didn't see it. Uh, now, it is worth noting, like me, she has not seen the movie. I, I just don't know what to say. I mean, that movie is as old as you and I are and a true classic. I don't just never saw it. I, did, I didn't watch horrors when I was a kid. Rated R movies just didn't happen. Just wasn't one of those things. And it, I don't know. They never appealed to get, I don't know. Maybe I should try to hunt it down. I don't even know if it's on any streaming. <laughs> anyway, so I ended up playing the shark again because I was the one that knew the rules and they're the most complicated. Uh, with only being two of us, Deanna had to play all three of the other characters. So, which is kind of interesting. If you play with two people, it's even weirder where you each control one character and then share one. I don't think I've ever seen a game where you share a character before like that. Like not you take turns, you just both control it. Not like you own it one turn, you own it the next turn. Whatever, anyway. Uh, game went well, but it felt long. Like it just, I don't know, playing through both parts took us a good hour and a half. I don't know what it says on the box, but it just felt longer than it should have. Uh, part of it was Deanna had a real hard time catching me in the first episode. Um, and I actually got to like the, the trigger where you just automatically go to the next section without any any um, barrels attached to my shark at that point. So I, I got to the the whatever requisite number of swimmers to jump. But what was cool was despite me doing like as well as possible in the first episode, the second episode was still really close and rather tense. So that was nice. Um, except for feeling a bit long, Deanna noted she thought it was neat and specifically wanted to point out that knowledge of the movie doesn't matter. Like, she's like, I, it was a game. It was fun. I enjoyed it. And not knowing Jaws didn't matter. Yeah, very true. Well, there are some nice things there for the movie fans to appreciate. It's not at all required. Uh, and I just want to point out that Deanna, Deanna does point out that it really does to her, especially not knowing the movie, feel like two separate games. Yeah. And whereas, I get it. It does. It, it very much has yeah. a delineated, you stop playing one game and start playing the other. Whereas at and least, get a reward based on how you did. Whereas at least knowing the movie, there's... It, 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 it sort of feels a little more contiguous, okay. a little. <laughs> Fair enough. 
All right, up next, I got some lighter fare. Um, we got a few rounds of Codenames Duet. I've been talking about that every week for it feels like a couple months now. I'll just say we're both still enjoying it, despite the fact that, man, we're re assassin crazy for the first few games the other day. We just, oh, we were, we were on the same page too much. I don't know. It was bad. Um, after Codenames, we grabbed Medium off the shelf. And the um, what I need to share about Medium is don't ever, ever drop that game. Uh, we talked about it in our review. The cards are very slippery. Uh, combined with the fact that there's 15 different decks in that game and the decks are delineated by very small numbers uh, means you are going to spend a lot of time cleaning up that game. This is worse than a game of 52 card pickup. Uh, we know this firsthand. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, I do have to say the game can be surprisingly fun and surprisingly blue, which is two players, especially after a couple adult beverages. Yeah, I don't think too many people who've played that game would be surprised for it to go blue after some adult beverages. Now, the other thing that I think fans of the show will find amusing is I found the secret to getting Deanna to play dexterity games, and that would be some local craft beer. I actually convinced her to play Mackie Stack. Uh, sort of by her calling it out. Now, Maki Stack is a game where you stack sushi um, using only two fingers because those are your chopsticks. And she was surprisingly good at it. Um, I played, on our first game, we played the basic rules, which is, you know, standard chopsticks, and I won. So then I penalized myself by using the baby fingers, and she kicked my butt using that. So and all I, it takes is the right beer, and we can get the Anna to play a dexterity game. And I have to say, seeing that picture pop up on Twitter was, <laughs> you know, the shock of the week, if not yeah. the pandemic, perhaps. Well, she's smiling, too. <laughs> like, like, she's happy. It was, it was great. At the time, I think I tweeted what beer it specifically took. There you go. She's like, <laughs> she has no memory of this effect now. So that leaves uh, one game. This is the one I think people wanted to hear the most about if they've been here since the start of the show. And thank you for sticking around. Uh, that leaves a big and epic game, uh, Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy. I got my Kickstarter all in except for the map version of this uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, it took a little while to get it to the table because I did have a component issue that they were happily enough, happy enough to fix. Um, so first off, I do have to say it's our first play. There, this is a big game. There's a lot going on, and there is a lot more to experience in the game. So, like, this is nowhere near final thoughts. But here are some quick thoughts after one play. Man, does this game take up a lot of room. Like, Eclipse took up a lot of room. This takes up a ridiculous amount of room. It's so like you've got your, your star map, right? Your hex tiles, like the board, which is pretty big, but not crazy. It's all the other stuff. Like, you've got a player board. You've got player trays. You've got two-player trays. you got your action cards. you got the, the central resources that you have to supposed to share, like the dice and the orbitals and stuff. And then you got the two different bags that you pull stuff out of. And now there's this, like, nice ship part market, which is really nice, but it's this big plastic tray. Like, I, I don't think I own a game that takes up more room than this. Like, this is crazy. And that was with two players. With two players, we used half of a 4 by 8 table. Plus, actually, I think the box might have like, gone over partway to the other side. Plus two side tables just to hold our player pieces. Yeah, I was shocked when the photos of this one showed up for a completely different reason than the, than the last yeah. show of <laughs> photos. Um, I, I felt like I don't know what we would have done if I had been there to play. Um, it, 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 I, I would have been down on the, on the other half of the table walking over to look at the board to play or something. It's like we just were having to much... stand up to do yeah. things. And this game plays six. I and yeah, like, I like, mean, like, where do you put all that stuff? You would need like, you, you almost know, multiple... need like a player table and the board. Yeah, I mean, people walk back and forth. Yeah, I mean, a lot of side tables and a table as big as yours, really. I mean, you know, the yeah. boardroom table. Like, you could do it if you put the map in the middle of my table and everyone's on the edges. Like, you, it, it's possible. But man, like, I just didn't like. This is the new streamlined edition. Yeah, I was, I was really surprised. I gotta say. Now, the game itself, okay, supposedly they tweaked it and revised it and streamlined it. I couldn't tell you. I honestly have no idea. Um, when I backed this on Kickstarter, I sold my original copy, probably a little soon, too soon because I was itching to play it and this got delayed a few times. Uh, but because of that, my memory's a little fuzzy. So I got to admit, I don't remember exactly how it played, but it felt the same. Like th this felt like I was playing Eclipse. Um, I was trying to guess at what they changed. It didn't feel longer, shorter or anything. But it, it 
they haven't changed the essence of what was Eclipse. I will say that. Uh, it probably was streamlined and probably did play better. I couldn't tell you either way. Well, you know, it's good. I mean, people liked Eclipse, and that's the reason yeah. why it got this. And so the fact that you're not noticing it not being Eclipse is, yeah. is only a good thing. No, exactly. It makes sense. Now, I do have to say the new components are nice, like really nice. Like they did some nice little touches, right? Like the UV printing, which is that reflective printing on all the space tiles and the miniatures. Wow. Like there's now instead of just having mini, like before you had to buy an expansion pack just to get the miniatures for your own armies. But now all the, the NPCs have miniatures, the guardians, the ancients, uh, your orbitals and monoliths are, are little things like the orbitals even hold the cube. Like they are really nice. Uh, the custom dice are a nice touch. They look nice. Instead of all, like, in the original game, they're all just D6s of different colors. Now the dice indicate how much damage they do. Uh, the player trays are really well designed. Like, all of that, I think, is enough to want to buy the new version. Like, even if even if they hadn't changed a single rule and just gave me the exact same stuff in a new box with shiny new bits, I'd be tempted. Excellent. Now, as for the actual game, so we played two players, and I guess it was interesting. Like, I, this has never happened in Eclipse before, but I never played two players. Again, I have no idea if this has anything to do with Second Dawn or Digital Eclipse. We did not interact with each other at all. Like, by the end of the game, we couldn't get to each other. There was no way for me to fly one of my ships to her systems and no way for her to fly her ships to my systems. Like, that was weird. And also, neither of us built fleets. We didn't build ships. Like, until the last couple of rounds... We didn't use the modifier build actions at all. And then at the end, we built up, like Deanna built up ships for absolutely no reason. She didn't do anything with them. I attacked one neutral system the entire game. There was one fight. In an entire game of Eclipse, we rolled dice once, which just felt kind of odd. Not bad, just odd. Now, I wouldn't say either of us had a bad time, but I gotta say, this is an epic 4X game. And I think for it to feel like an epic 4X game, you need more than two people. So I think to really enjoy Eclipse, I need a bigger group. And a bigger table, apparently. <laughs> yes. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right. So next week's our 100th episode. I got a giveaway to put together. That's, that's a big one because we're going to be giving away two games. Uh, as far as reviews, we are going to be looking at Jaws next week, uh, Final Thoughts, and Katana. And I plan in to try to get in a couple of those games each. Uh, cause like I said, at this point, I haven't quite, my mind's not completely made up. I'm, I'm still waiting for Katana to wow me with the, the full rules. Once we finally play it the right way and Jaws, I need to, I need to not play the shark at least once. Yep. We're hoping for a couple of those and that who knows, I don't think Eclipse is going to happen again with more than two players for a while, but I would love to get that to the table again. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate your support. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark, join the MM team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering at twitch.com slash misdirectedmark. Evil John, oh man, the snacks. You keep sharing all those snacks. The man snacks better than I eat. Man, Wayne Humphlet, thanks, Wayne. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you like the content we're providing, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around even if the stream goes down briefly and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.